We're calling our study an outing at the palace. You'll see why in a minute. Esther chapter 4. Providence is something we believe in but don't fully understand. All of the definitions are a little different. I like this one. Providence is the act of seeing and providing or preparing for the future and biblically refers to God's foresight and power to watch over and protect and provide for His creatures. It's a good definition for several reasons. Number one, it takes into account both foresight and providing, which are the meanings of the two roots from which providence as a word is formed. And secondly, it specifically mentions its biblical application. And third, it doesn't go too far theologically in terms of deciding exactly how providence is manifested. It tells you that there is providence, but as far as exactly how that works out, uh, we're still uh, debating. My paraphrase of biblical providence would be, providence is God seeing to it that His plan for the future stays on track in the present. Theologians can go to extremes in discussing and describing providence, and these are real uh, positions. Um, Maybe you hold one or the other one of them, but I would consider them extreme. One extreme is called omnicausality. Aren't you glad that you learned these big words? Omnicausality. That says that God causes your every action in such a way as to determine completely its nature and its outcome. The other extreme is called open theism. That's a teaching that God has granted to humanity free will and that in order for the free will to be free, the future free will choices of individuals cannot be known ahead of time by God. So He doesn't know what you're going to do. He doesn't know if you're going to have a nitro coffee later or not. (laughs) He's worried about that if you're an open theist. I may be oversimplifying, but that's about right as far as the extremes. And I'm guessing most, if not all of us, think that the true answer must be somewhere in the middle where I am no mere robot of omnicausality, but where God definitely remains omniscient. We may not be able to explain in a totally satisfactory way the relationship of free will and God's providence, but we can see it everywhere in the Bible and nowhere more clearly than Esther. And in some ways, this, I think, is a It's not the greatest moment in the book of Esther, but it's a peak where we see uh, a lot of the purpose of this book. Uh, I think a great deal of the purpose of this book has to do with showing us God's providence uh, against the backdrop of our free will. And so let's get into chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned that all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. I almost wish we would adopt the practice of tearing our clothes and putting on sackcloth and ashes. It would completely eliminate our sometimes empty greetings that ask, how are you doing? Imagine showing up to church that way, just (laughs) ah, ah, throwing ashes on your head. You'd get the ushers on that guy right away. Say, hey, there's somebody that needs help right there. Sackcloth was forbidden in the palace. They wanted to maintain the facade that everything was awesome. Esther lived in the very lap of luxury, so much so that she had no idea what was happening right outside her very doors. It was a little insulated kind of thing. It was a Marie Antoinette let them eat cake kind of thing. She just kind of hung out in the palace. And there's a whole thread we could take here just talking about Esther and what a terrible life she had. Uh, unless that's your idea of, of real living, just being confined to a palace and having a loveless relationship with the king who was kind of an idiot. Uh, verse 3, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrive, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. This wasn't just wearing a pin or a ribbon or a bracelet to promote your cause. Now, I'm not against any of those things, but I think they're just about out of colors as far as different uh, ribbons that you can wear. Uh, And, and, you know, that's great to to show support for something, your bracelet or your ribbon, but these people put on a whole outfit of mourning, and then they threw ashes over their head from their, probably from their home oven. It was a total commitment to grieving. I mean, you got into it. You thought, hey, if it's worth 
uh, grieving, let's get into it and go all the way. Sackcloth, rough clothing, tearing that stuff up and throwing ashes as you go. No one could mistake your commitment to grief. And so verse 4, so Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Apparently, Esther, as I said, could not leave the palace. She was confined within those walls. Uh, the Holy Spirit is establishing the emptiness and shallowness of living comfortably when right outside your door there is trouble. And for her part, J. Vernon McGee has a whole uh, teaching where he goes off on how she's just trying to cover uh, what's going on. She said, hey, give Mordecai some clothes, and, and that'll take care of it. You know, maybe, maybe sackcloth's all he got right now, and so, you know, the rest of his stuff's in the laundry, and so let's just give him the proper clothing and get back to regular life. But it wasn't going to be that easy. And so verse 5, then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. I don't want to spend too much time reviewing, but if you weren't here for the previous studies, uh, Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. Uh, it's a personal thing, not a religious thing, because it's not wrong for Jews to show respect culturally. Uh, he just doesn't like Haman. Haman is, is not the kind of guy you want to have as an enemy, uh, not with his power. <clears throat> and so he says, I don't want to just kill Mordecai. I want to kill all his people. Uh, and so they write a decree and have the king sign it with his little signet ring that uh, on a certain day, all of the Jews in the kingdom can be killed and their property confiscated. And so that's the background. And so Mordecai now boldly calls upon Esther to intercede on behalf of the Jews. You know, I was thinking about this. When, when we think of interceding or intercession, we think of a type of prayer. When I say intercede, you think prayer. Here we see that intercession calls for involvement of some kind. When you pray for someone, you'd better be ready to get involved with them as well because you are often the answer or part of the answer to your own prayers for them. And this is something we joke about it around here from a ministry standpoint. Sometimes we say that, you know, people come up and they say, hey, uh, I've noticed this area of need. Uh, we, there's a ministry that could be done over here. And, and we smile and say, hey, <laughs> go for it. God's obviously put a burden on Well, no, I didn't. I just, it needs to be done, but I didn't think I was. Well, yeah, well, I didn't notice it. Why should I do it? All these other people, no one else has noticed it, so maybe that's the Holy Spirit working on your heart. And so when we pray for people, I mean, that, I'm not saying we should quit praying because we're afraid we might have to actually do something. <laughs> people say, hey, will you pray for me? No. <laughs> what do you mean, no? Uh, I don't want to have any real commitment to having to do anything to help you in this situation. And, and so, but I mean, you know, he didn't really ask Esther to, Esther to pray. He said, hey, I want you to go talk to the king. I want you to intercede. I want you to do something because we're all going to be slaughtered. And, and so don't quit praying, but let the Holy Spirit in your prayer touch your heart in such a way that you want to be a part of helping the situation. The world is abounding with Mordecai's. There are needs upon needs. Most of us here in the United States are Esther's. We're pretty comfortable. We're pretty insulated. We don't always know or care what is going on just outside our gates. Um, I don't want to get off on track, but I'm going to do it anyway. <clears throat> There's a Facebook thing or a social media thing. It's a guy... And there's, he's doing, he, he has gumballs that represent uh, the poor people in the world. Have you seen that one? Anybody seen what I'm talking about? And he's got these big jars, huge jars full of gumballs, and each one represents like a million people and how many impoverished people there are in different continents and different countries. And the whole point of it is that even if we took, you know, 
one million people from the gumball jar of, of India and brought them to the United States to help them, we wouldn't make a dent in any of these problems. There's, and and the, the, the conclusion he comes to is there's no way to help these people. They need to help themselves in the situation that they're in. And from a political standpoint, people are, yeah, right on. But from a Christian standpoint, you need to help people. You, you, they're not gumballs. They're people, and if you help one person, you know, Jesus didn't have that attitude. That's the whole problem with the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000. The, the disciples had that attitude that we sometimes, hey, there's a bunch of people here. We only got some fish and some bread. And this is impossible. Send them away to care for themselves. And Jesus said, well, why don't we just do something about this? And, and they did. It was fantastic. And so we want to do stuff. Are we willing to go before the king and intercede on behalf of those who have need? And then are we willing to get involved? Of course we are. How could we live in luxury, ignoring the needs outside our walls, if Jesus is really our passion and our purpose for living? He came from heaven to earth, and he touched people like you and me. And so that's what we want to be up to. <clears throat> Verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command for Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. Man, she's lonely. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Esther's trying to convince Mordecai and herself that there was nothing she could do in this situation. In her case, it was because of the very real danger of execution. So he, she said, hey, I can't do anything. What do you want me to do? This is the law. If I go in there, I might get killed. If, you, you know, if she goes in there, she might not get killed. But she's overblowing. The, it, it's a real danger, but... You know, this is her excuse. Do we ever look at some situation and say, hey, there's nothing we can do. It's too dangerous. It's too difficult. We need to factor in God and do what is right. Or better, not so much do what is right. We need to do what God tells us to do. We need to follow his leading and do what he tells us to do. And so verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Oh, Wow. Did you catch the significance of what he just said? He hinted at it in verse 8, calling the maybe 15 million Persian Jews her people, but that might simply mean they were citizens of Persia whom Queen Esther ought to care for, just general people. You, they're your people. They're the citizens of Persia. They're a particular people group that you should care for. But now he says something much more direct. You've heard of the term outing. It's most commonly used today to describe the act of disclosing a person's sexual orientation or gender identity without that person's consent. We talk about people who have come out of the closet or who have been outed by the media. Mordecai just outed Esther as a Jew. It would have been a shock to her servants. No one knew she was a Jew until this moment. Now, we occasionally need shock treatment. I like to call it shock treatment for God's elect or, you ready? elect shock treatment. Huh? <laughs> That's pretty good. Actually, it's stupid, but why, you know. There's two kinds of humor. There's really, there's sharp humor that's really brilliant, and there's just being stupid, and I favor the latter. We need to hear something or see something that causes us to say to ourselves, hey, I'm a Christian. I need to act. I need to get involved. In verse 14, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai believed in divine providence. He knew God must intervene because God had made unconditional promises to Abraham about his descendants, and especially that through the Jews, the Savior of the world would be born. That hadn't happened yet, and many other things that God had promised the Jews unconditionally hadn't happened yet. And so Mordecai, as a Jew, believed in divine providence. He knew that God foresaw these events, foresaw the future in his omniscience, and was able to provide for them. 
This doesn't mean that Mordecai was saved in the way that we would talk about salvation. You can believe in providence as a force without having faith. A lot of people do. Even today, people look upon Israel and they would acknowledge providence at work, something at work, even though uh, the people acknowledging it are mostly unbelievers and the Jews in the Holy Land are mostly unbelievers in Jesus Christ. I, I remember growing up, every time something would happen, the Six-Day War or something like that in Israel, my dad, who was a, you know, a backslidden Catholic mason, would say, God's got his hands on those people. You don't want to mess with Israel. And so he believed in a divine providence when it came to Israel, and most people do when it comes to Israel. And so did Mordecai. And so I don't know that this is some big moment of, of coming to God or a come to Jesus moment for Mordecai, uh, but he does believe in providence. Now, though some may argue, and, the, and they do and they would, I see Mordecai and Esther as free agents making extremely bad wrong choices but God, by His providence, providing for His plan without really violating their free will. This is not omnicausality. You can't really say, or I don't think we want to say, God made Esther the queen for just this moment, because if you do that, you make God complicit with her sin in getting to that moment. It was her free choice to enter the queen search to partake of forbidden foods and rituals, to commit fornication with the king, and then to marry him, all of that against the stated will of God. And so if you want to say that God caused Esther to do those things, then God is the author of sin. There's, uh, there's a lot of philosophical hoops you might be able to jump through, but that's the bottom line. If, if God determined all of that ahead of time so that he could be uh, ready with Esther as the queen, I, I think you have a real huge problem in, in uh, the nature of God. There she was, though, and if she came clean about her heritage, God could use her. Grace would abound. If not, God could have worked in other ways. Mordecai said as much himself. He, he believed in divine providence. He says, who knows if this is why you became queen, but if you don't do this, God's still going to act. He, he didn't, Mordecai didn't say, man, I get it all now. This is why we made Esther queen, because this is what God had in mind. He said, you ought to do this because, you know, this is the position you're in, but if not, God's still going to do something. God would act regardless to provide for his plan to have the Savior of the world be born a Jew. You might have made some bad decisions. You might be where you are because of a, a disobedience to God. I think sometimes we just need to own up to that and, and not blame the devil or God. Just say, hey, I, I, I messed up. I'm, I made wrong decisions. Whoever or wherever, rather, you are today, God can still restore you and use you in a powerful way. And that's something wonderful about Esther. And so I would emphasize this does not give you an excuse to make bad decisions or stay in the wrong place with the wrong people. Greg Laurie tweeted this week, when you hang out with the wrong people in the wrong places, you'll soon do the wrong things. And all of us can attest to that and say amen to that. Verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. And neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did uh, according to all that Esther commanded him. Esther goes from being a closet Jew to calling for a nationwide Jewish fast, not just for herself, but for all the Jews and her own servants and Mordecai. I like it. It says she commanded Mordecai. This is the first moment in which she's telling him what to do. When you decide to repent and return to walking with God, just go for it. Don't be weighed down by the things which have gone before. Get up to spiritual speed in a heartbeat. Again, I can't say the total spiritual condition of Esther at this time, but she says, okay, it's on. I'm going to go before the king. You're going to fast. All the Jews are going to fast. My household is going to fast. Three days, not just lunch. 
we're going to get into this thing, and then I'm going to go before the king, and if he holds out his scepter, fine. If he doesn't, fine. If I perish, I perish. And so she, you know, five minutes ago, she said, hey, put on a, a, a you know, a plaid shirt and come on in, and let's, you know, watch some TV or something. Now she's like, okay, I've, I've got my mind screwed on now. This is happening, and so let's go. So, you know, don't wallow in your sin. Confess your sin. Repent of your sin. And know that God has forgiven your sin. It's as far away as the east is from the west. It's thrown into the sea and, and sinking to the bottom. And just start serving him where you're at. And so Esther counted the cost, and she was willing to pay it. She would lose her life if it came to it. But she would lose it serving God and her people, and thus we would say she had found her life. The cost of discipleship is never anything less than your life. But in losing your life, you find it. The risk is always canceled out by the reward. Something else to consider, of course, she was going to lose her life anyway. She had been outed as a Jew, and she would therefore be killed when the day of slaughter came. She was going to die one way or the other. Living in comfort, ignoring needs, is always a mirage. Live that way, surrounded by or at least pursuing the material world, and you're going to lose your life anyway, and you'll have nothing to show for it in the end. Mordecai and Esther had exercised their free will. They had defied the will of God. Mordecai brought this crisis upon himself and upon his people due to his pride. I don't know if I've ever really let that sink in before, but this time through Esther, I'm realizing that if he had simply showed respect, if he had shaken hands with Haman, bowed down before him, which was okay for a Jew to do, none of this would have happened. He brought all of this upon himself. I simply cannot accept that God led them both to sin in order to get her to be queen so that she could save her people. I, I can't believe that of God because that's not the way Jesus portrays God the Father in the New Testament. They chose freely, and then God overruled. Had they finally refused to walk in God's will, I quote Mordecai, relief and deliverance for the Jews would have come some other way. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but you are free to choose along the way. Maybe this illustration will help, and we end with this. Every parent wants their child or children to make the right choices. Good parenting teaches children to think for themselves to come to the right choices. It gives them room to make mistakes and then to learn from those mistakes. But good parenting also sees to it, as much as is humanly possible, that children do not make foolish, even fatal mistakes. You step in and you exert your will for their greater good at moments like that. The kids remain free, but their freedom is curtailed so that the parents ultimately get their way. God is your heavenly Father, and He wants you to obey Him for your own good. He's given you freedom, but He will act providentially when necessary to see that all things work together for good for you as His child. Amen. Amen. 